join me in prayer. Almighty Father, we come before you at this great day, time that we can come before you. That we can honor you in all things by the praise of our lips, by the study that we do, and focusing on you as we come out of the world. For we know the world has nothing in you, and one day you will replace it with your kingdom. So we pray, Almighty Yahweh, that you'll be with us this day. Help us to understand your word better. We may teach others uh, when those that ask of the hope that is within us. We thank you also for the many brethren who have come out of the world, those who are seeking that we might be a help to them as well. And so may you continue to bless this day as we honor you and all those who are sincerely seeking you on your Sabbath day. In Yahshua's name we pray. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. Great to see everybody back in the saddle, so to speak. When it's 95 outside, it is nice to be under air conditioning, you know. But uh, glad to have you. If you ever had a pristine experience that was followed by an unpleasant event, then you'll know, you'll have a, an indication of how Yahshua felt after his immersion by John the Baptist. Matthew 3.16 says, And Yahshua, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove, lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Who would not want to be there witnessing this? Either sitting in a tree or on a rock or whatever, watching Yahshua get baptized. Who would not want to see that? It's one of those dramas you could cherish forever. And a drama that's written on eternity. An amazing moment. Wonderful. A spiritual high. And then comes the downer by name of Hasatan. He enters the picture. Then was Yahshua led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Not surprisingly, you know, the deceiver tried to destroy this afterglow of the moment of Yahshua's immersion. This holy and pristine act of obedience to his father. Not just to cast a pall over the event, but to defeat the son. His real objective was to derail Yahshua's faith. And the evil one often tries with us the same thing after our immersion. You're immersed, then you're tried. Don't know how you're tried. Everybody's different. But he hits us usually where we're weakest to see if we can be overthrown in our faith. Because he doesn't want us to make that commitment to Yahweh, not at all. He hates it. He hates it. So his real objective was to overthrow Yahshua the Messiah. Destruction is his middle name. Asatan rejoices at our ruination. He claps at our calamity. He delights in our downfall. He laughs at our losses. He savors our sadness. That's the kind of guy he is. Yahshua is known as the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15.45 And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, or the second Adam, was made a quickening spirit. In verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the master from heaven. So here in a nutshell is us. If you think about it, we start physically as the sons of Adam in this world, in our, the creation that Yahweh has established here, but we end up spiritually as children of Messiah if we remain faithful, if we continue on the rest of our lives doing Yahweh's will. 1549, uh, and as we have, uh, have uh, born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear 
the image of the heavenly. And that's what Yahweh's doing. He's creating a family for the heavens, for his kingdom to one day be with him and serve him for an eternity here on earth. Did I say Satan never gives up? We're seeing the devil hard at work right now, doing his level best to wreak havoc in our world and throw the faith of the saints. We must not get caught up in the evils going on, but continue resolutely on that path that we are committed to, to serving him, no matter what may come, no matter what happens. We've got, we can't get caught up in the evils going on, but continually and resolutely on the path of righteousness for which we will be judged. We look and live, live for a greater world, a greater existence. This world isn't it. This one's going to pass away. This one's going to be destroyed eventually. We look for a greater life, a greater kingdom, no matter what. Like Stephen totally at peace while the rocks, the stones are being thrown at him, looking up to heaven and seeing Yahshua and Yahweh, and he didn't care what happened after that. He knew he would one day be with them, totally at peace. We need more of that in our world today. This world will fade and die away. We have to be a force for truth and right in an age of lawlessness. We don't need to fear if we trust Yahweh, brethren. Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6, He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, so that we may boldly say, Yahweh is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. What do we have to fear anyway? If we're in his the palm of his hand, what do we have to fear? Is he going to let us fail? Is he going to let us, something bad, terrible happen to us? If we're focused on him, he will guide us through and all trials and tribulations will be nothing to him. As Yahshua was tempted to prove his devotion to the Father, so we get tested during the trials of this life, small or great. Each time we overcome those machinations of Satan, we grow stronger and our spirit gets better in the faith. Like a muscle pushing against an obstacle, pushing against opposition, it gets stronger. Well, let's see how Yahshua handled temptation right after his baptism. Let's, let's analyze this a bit. I'm sure you know the stories, but maybe you haven't delved deeply into it. Matthew 4.1. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he's afterward a hungered. Now that's the understatement of the century. We don't read of any complaints from Yahshua. I mean, over a month, a month and almost a half, we don't read of his complaining. As he starves from lack of food and water for this time, We, on the other hand, sometimes do our own subdued grumbling when we have to fast for a day, don't we? You hear it, man. They start talking food, and then everybody starts saying, oh. (laughs) Just one day of fasting, like atonement, and uh, we talk about it a lot. We've got to be careful that we don't turn into Israel, craving the leeks and the melons of captivity in Egypt. We've got to go back. We're tired of this manna. This manna, this what is it? We're tired of eating this. We want all that good stuff, forgetting what they had to go through in Egypt. Slaves. They were slaves. And all I could think about was food. Or like the crowds following Yahshua around just to stuff their bellies with fish and bread. We, as his first fruits, must get past the physical and focus on the spiritual more and more as we grow in the spirit, wherein lies our salvation. So the tempter in chief comes along to Yahshua and says, If you be the son of Yahweh, command that these stones be made bread. Two takeaways. First of all, he says, if. He knew he was the son of Yahweh, but, you know, cast a dispersion on his character. Oh, if you're the son. Now, a lot, the natural man would re- 
will just rebel at that. You know, I just want to, ugh, what do you mean if, you know? So he commands these stones to make bread, he says. So what a strategist. Satan loves to hit when we are most vulnerable with the most enticing of temptations. And this is a pretty big one when you fasted for 40 days. He leads off with questioning the legitimacy of our Savior. That would get his natural spirit riled up immediately. So I'll tempt him with that, if. But Yahshua answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Feeding his belly was far from Yahshua's mind. His focus was on the spiritual. Physical satisfaction is only temporary. He knew it. He understood it. He was far past that. Spiritual needs are far more critical and far more important. That's the lesson of this first temptation that Satan leveled at our Savior. So was the deceiver washed up after losing round one? Are you kidding? Not by a long shot. He won't let up on us either. Remember that. He's always going to be after us. We are the prize in Satan's eyes because we are the apple of Yahweh's. So if he can overthrow us, in essence, he can get back at Yahweh big time. Verse 4. Or verse 5 of uh, chapter 4. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If you, again, if, if you be the son of Yahweh, cast yourself down, for it's written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Now, what's this? Tempting Yahshua with being Superman? What, what, what kind of odd, don't you think? But think deeper. Think a lot deeper. We can take away at least two lessons from this encounter. Humans have a natural desire to grandstand, to be the life of the party, to be the center of attention. At social gatherings, many like to steal the show. Imagine what a hit. Yahshua would be with the local spectators to watch him jump off that pinnacle and just about hit the ground and angels take him right up. Imagine the talk of the town, the talk of the world swept up in just a moment of the twinkling just before. Now there's a rush if you ever had one. That would prove you are the son of Yahweh. At least this may appeal to the flesh, but Yahshua, again, was far above, so to speak, such theatrics. Big miscalculation on Satan's part. The second takeaway is that Satan is well-versed in the scriptures. He knows the scriptures. And he will use them and abuse them to overthrow. Yahweh's people have to be aware of that. He'll try to overthrow you, too. He does this by twisting scripture or leaving parts out. There's many ways that you can deceive. He knows all of them. But when we study and know the scriptures, this subterfuge will fail. It won't work because we know what it really says. And here the evil one quotes Psalm 91.12 using Yahweh's very word in a vain attempt to overthrow Yahshua's faith, overthrow his commitment to his father. He tries to turn an illustration of Yahweh's faithfulness into a literal demonstration. See how he does that? The entire Psalm 91 is so powerful about Yahweh's protection of his people, especially what's happening in our world. I want to read the entire psalm. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge and my fortress, my Elohim, and him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. 
He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Do we have that kind of faith? That he's going to keep us in the hollow of his hand. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made Yahweh, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. You know, you make Yahweh first in your life. What do you have to worry about? No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you. Enter Hasatan at that point there. To keep you in all your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Yahweh's right there all the time. Just talk to him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, having struck out twice, Satan now attempts the grand slam to tempt Yasha with the best he can muster. First, it's food. Then, it's showmanship. And now, it's for all the marvels. He hits Yahshua at the core of the very purpose for which he comes to earth to lay the groundwork in establishing kingdom rulership. Matthew 4, 8, again, The devil takes him up in the exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says unto him, all these things will I give you if, there's that word again, if you will fall down and worship me. Sell me your soul. Most people crave power, prestige, and and or influence. Having worked in the political environment, I can tell you, It's very true. I can vouch for it. The devil's offer meant that Yahshua could have vaunted power, great power, immediately, without going through all the pain and suffering that he knew was ahead of him to do it Yahweh's way. I can give you a shortcut. Try it my way. (coughs) All he had to do to achieve this shortcut was to bow down to Satan instead of his father. Instead of his father. If he were successful, it would spell the doom of humanity, including you and I. Our salvation was there, hanging in the balance of whatever Yahshua decided. Then said Yahshua unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and him only shall you serve game over. What is behind all of Satan's evil devices to separate us from Yahweh? He goes about, the word says, like a lion seeking whom he may devour and destroy our faith to undermine our whole lives. I mean, it worked in Eden, right? It worked with Adam and Eve. The first Adam, why not with the second Adam? Using the same enticements. John speaks of it in John, uh, 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world. Get this. Start. Remember back how Satan tempted Joshua. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of this world. Let's dissect these three in light of the temptation of uh, the two Adams. Lust of the flesh, first Adam, 
delicious forbidden fruit. Wow, that sure looks good. And it'll make you wise, his wife says. And for Yahshua, a famished Yahshua, hot, fresh bread. It gets more tempting as we go on. Lust of the eyes is next. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Eve, your eyes will be open to new and greater understanding. Yahshua, jump off the pinnacle and the spectacle would be the talk of the world. And you'd be the top of the world. This will give you legitimacy like nothing else. And then the final, the pride of life. Eve, just imagine, you can be a mighty one with one bite of that fruit. You can be somebody. Boy, there's many, many people who lust for that. And Yahshua's, what, his, what was his situation? You can have planet-wide rulership now with all the glory that that means and will bring, avoiding all the pain and suffering that you're about to go through. Just avoid it. One quick bow, and it's over. Satan knew that if he could somehow pull Yahweh away from his father, he would have the ultimate prize, infinitely greater than what he got when he enticed a third of the angels to follow him, he'd have Yahweh's very own son. Why did it even try? Many have asked that. Why not? He had nothing to lose and a world to gain, a universe to gain, maybe. If there were zero chance of success, would he have tried? That's a million-dollar question. Through Yahshua's response, we learn a boatload from his encounter with the adversary. Number one, against the stones and bread temptation, Yahshua counters with. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. The word that proceeds from the Father's mouth, we know as the Old and New Testaments. The foundation of this ministry is the whole Bible. We got a, a letter from a man just recently. He says, I also believe we need to have the whole Bible, not just the last third. He's right. Every word that proceeds out of Yahweh's mouth. The foundation is right there. All we have to do is stand on it. That makes us pretty rare among churches and ministries this day, today most of which pull the new away from the old and teach only a third of the word. And even though a third of the New Testament is made up quotations and references to the Old Testament 2,600 times. But we don't need that Old Testament. We'll read the New Testament. And by the way, while we're reading the New Testament, we're also reading the Old Testament because it quotes it over and over and over. Or it references it, gets its lessons from over and over and over. We know that. We see it. As for the pinnacle temptation, Yahshua responds, it is written, you shall not tempt Yahweh your Elohim. That is, do not put Yahweh to the test. Interesting that Satan quotes scripture, but leaves out that part that Yahshua quoted. He says, don't play games with Yahweh. I know a fellow who was uh, kind of showing off one time. He was driving his Jeep right near the edge of a 100-foot cliff. And someone says, are you crazy? He said, hey, hey, nothing to worry about. Yahweh won't let me happen, let that happen. Really? Reminds me of the famous last words of a Civil War officer who was advised to take cover because of the advancing army started shooting at him. He said, oh. The stubborn officer arrogantly replied, they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn at this dist. His bravado came at the highest cost. As for the mountain vista and kingdom's temptation, Yahshua answered with it is written, you shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and him only shall you serve. In these temptations, we learn three lessons. 
Physical always takes back seat to spiritual. Always. We may strive for physical things in this world, but that ain't going to get it. That's not going to get it. Those things will fade away. Rust, fade away. We also learn never tempt Yahweh and also make him the priority in our life and worship. In a dispute with somebody over beliefs, use Yahshua's approach. Quote the word. That's all you got to do. Instead of argue, you know, you think that, I think that. Just quote the word. If someone wants to take on your faith, have enough knowledge of the word that you can quote and answer their arguments, their beliefs with scripture. Go to the source. Who can argue with direct biblical quotations? We should all be able to defend our faith. That's what we're trying to do every Sabbath, to learn his word and during the week to study his word, as Joshua did. The ministry that fails to do that, to make teaching the word, preach the word, be instant in in season, out of season, the ministry that fails to do that is headed for trouble. I'll guarantee it. If they can't preach the word, they're going to have problems, big problems. The word is a top priority, and they're negligent and heading for trouble if they don't do it. If you need guidance on a particular issue, the first thing to do is to see what Yahshua said and see what Yahshua did. That's why he got immersed, to fulfill all righteousness so that we would have a pattern to follow. He didn't need to be immersed. He had no sins to deal with, but he did it for us. He did it for our example. He's the gold standard for everything in life. And what did he teach as well as what did he practice? When it came to immersion, because if we get it right with our judge, then our future is secure and he is going to be our judge. I think I want to do what he did, don't you? How can he criticize that? (laughs) He'll bless you for it. He'll say, look, I I came to this world as an example for my people to teach them and forgive them a way, a path to believe this word and, and follow it. Blessed are you. Enter into life everlasting because you did what I said. You did what I did. So, know what the judge of our salvation said about baptism. He who believes, you have to have a belief, you have to know what the word is and says, and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Does that mean if I'm not immersed, I don't have the hope of salvation? Well, here it is right from the source who will decide everyone's fate. Except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5. Yahshua is talking about the waters of immersion and the laying out of hands that follows for the spirit to be endowed on that person. He mentions two significant parts of baptism, water and spirit. Some people think, well, all you need is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's not what... That's not what he's talking about. Why, would, why wasn't he baptized in the Holy Ghost? No, he went down into the water, the rivers of Jordan, and John the Baptist was standing there. And John says, oh, no, you're, I'm not going to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And that's when Yahshua says, to fulfill all righteousness, this is what I've got to do. So John did it. Yahshua never asked any of his disciples to baptize him. He never asked Uh, you know, Peter, James, or John. He didn't baptize himself like some people do today because, for one thing, they can't give the Holy Spirit if they don't have it. You can't baptize yourself. And Yahshua did according to the word to be baptized. Repentance, you see, it follows from repentance. First, you have to repent. And Peter said in Acts 2, What do we do? We just murdered our Savior, our own judge for eternity, for salvation. What are we going to do? There's no no way. There's no path. Now we're we're doomed. 
He said, oh, no. You can repent, and then you can be baptized. Repent. What does that mean? It's more that I'm just, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then go back to business as usual. No, it is a complete 180 change in your life. You make that commitment, you're going to change your life. You're going to start being obedient. You're going to start keeping the Sabbath, the feast days, the Ten Commandments. You're going to start doing that. It's not just, well, I can just repent again. No. (laughs) Don't tempt Yahweh. We just learned that. It's a complete 180 change in behavior and life to follow Yahweh in all things. Obedience without argument. Compliance without resistance. Following immersion, we receive the Holy Spirit by the laying hands of the ministry, which will teach and guide your life from that point on. 1 Timothy 4.14. Yahshua sought baptism. And that meant to carry through that, that point to the rest of his life. How? How could he have just been baptized and then acceded to Satan's desires? Can you imagine? Making a commitment and immediately let Satan have his way. No. No. Yahshua's life through every action shows us how to live acceptably with our Father in heaven in every aspect of our spiritual and physical life. Nothing was left out. The essentials are all there to be had. He was our example so that we will say, I have no excuse. He did it, so must I. Those who request baptism must be committed to a lifelong, totally devoted walk with Yahweh and and his son at the head. If not, if they someday forsake their vows, they'll be in danger of Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, the sin for which there is no remedy. You turn back on your faith completely, there's there's no remedy for that. That's very serious. The sin for which there is no repentance. It is a grave mistake none of us should ever find ourselves making. We must be totally resolute and committed once we make that commitment. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to enlighten spiritually means to imbue with the saving knowledge of his word and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit through baptism, the laying on of hands, and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the world to come. If, having done all this and committed to all of this, if they shall fall away to renew them unto repentance, seeing they impale themselves to the son of Elohim afresh and put him to an open shame. In other words, snubbing Yahshua's example, snubbing what he commands and snubbing what he did through his own example. If you have the right understanding of truth and have received the Holy Spirit through the laying out of hands, then to turn completely away is to burn your bridge. No going back. As Yahshua said about Judas, it had been better if that man had never been born. Imagine, deceiving, deceiving our very uh, Savior, deceiving through his acts and causing his death. Well, it had to be. I mean, (laughs) somebody had to be found to do it. This guy was right right for the pickings. But I guess he had a choice too. And after he did it, he threw the 30 pieces of silver at the, at the chief priests and whatever and went and hanged himself. He had to have known. Once taught and convicted, the next step is submit through immersion in baptism. Our past sins washed away because we are immersed underwater, not just sprinkled or poured. Sometimes, you know, you wash your hands, you're just getting like this. You're not getting them clean. They're just 
there's a lot of dirt in those little grooves in your, in your you know, skin. And then you've got to be immersed. You've got to wash. And that's what we have to do spiritually as well. Submit through immersion. Our past sins are washed away. Acts 22, 16. Not by water, but by the blood of Yahshua the Messiah. It's symbolic, yes. We are immersed in water. That is a symbol of uh, death of our old person, our old man, our old man, and then raised into a new life as Yahshua was. That's what it depicts. It's essential. Acts 19, 3 to 5, And he said unto them, Unto what were you baptized? And they said, this is John's people, John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. You got the first step, but you got to do the rest. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Messiah Yahshua. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the sovereign Yahshua. People say, I've already been baptized. Some say, I've been baptized 10 times. <laughs> but were you baptized into Yahshua's name? I mean, not JC. I mean, Yahshua's name. Because every example in the, in the New Testament was in Yahshua's name. Look it up. There's like six of them. Six examples. Baptism is the highest form of worship. I think a, a human being can participate in. Allowing ourselves to be put to death figuratively to follow Yahshua the Messiah. Now, some prophets are very good at uh, object lessons, you know, making something, uh, building a little house and then destroying it, and that's a lesson he, he's trying to, you know, tell Israel or Judah, that's just how it's going to happen to you. When you become baptized, you're an object lesson of putting yourself underwater and killing the old man. It's a burial. You don't, you don't bury somebody by sprinkling dirt on their head. Baptism means to go underwater, overwhelm. Baptizo in the Greek, they didn't, bat, they, they didn't uh, translate it, interestingly enough, because it would have blown their whole doctrine of sprinkling or pouring if they had translated it correctly, saying immersion. But they didn't do it. That was a, that was a, a fault of the... Of the uh, Translators, and uh, it kind of carries through most of the translations as well. It's the highest form of worship. Yahshua said, no greater love exists than to give up your life for a friend. Yahshua gave his life for, he calls his followers sometimes friends. He gave up his life for that. We're baptized into his name and thereby experience, as it were, his death, we become a part of him through his death. As we die to sin and to figuratively be resurrected as we rise from the water, from the watery grave. Hey, Lucas here at the Wire and Production Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the logo over on the right. Also, ring that bell icon so that you're notified every time we upload a new teaching. And lastly, don't forget to download the YRM mobile app. It's free and full of content. If you love the Bible like we do, you won't want to miss it. And as always, thank you so much for watching.